Idaho murder suspect Brian Christopher Koberger was recently taken into custody after police suspect he may have been involved in the now infamous University of Idaho killings. Investigators say that Brian Koberger, 28 years old, may have snuck into the home of several college students and murdered four as they slept. The details of the case against Christopher Koberger are still unfolding. So it's important to keep in mind that all of the statements and claims in this video are purely allegations until the court proceedings have been carried out. That's a process that could take many months or even years. But for now, things are not looking good for Mr. Koberger or the countless people who were deeply affected by the Idaho murders. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Ty Knotts. Here on True Crime Stories, I do my best to cover cold cases, many of which you've never heard of, and share the stories of some of the world's most disturbing killers. More importantly, it's my goal to share the stories of the victims and their families and their search for closure after being subjected to some of the most heinous crimes imaginable. So if you'd like to support my work here on True Crime Stories, all I ask is that you hit the like button and subscribe. It's totally free and helps spread awareness of these cases. But with that, let's get started. So who is Brian Koberger and what did he do? Details about Brian Koberger and his interesting yet troublesome life are still unfolding. But Koberger is a criminal justice graduate who attended Washington State University while working towards his doctorate degree. Back in 2018, Koberger had attended Northampton Community College in Pennsylvania and was given an associate's degree in psychology. He would later receive a bachelor's degree in 2020 and finally completed his studies back in June of 2022. While he had initially gone to school for psychology, by the time he graduated, he'd achieved a Master's of Arts in Criminal Justice. We'll touch more on that later, because the details of his graduation are extremely suspicious, and new allegations have come to light that suggest he may have been studying the BTK killer alongside a professor at his college, and he could have been involved with the BTK killer personally. So stick around because you don't want to miss this disturbing development in Koberger's case. One of the most important aspects of cases like this, at least for me, is understanding how criminals like this could become such heartless monsters and kill innocent people for seemingly no reason at all. To better understand this question and how Brian Koberger ended up becoming a serial killer, it's important to look back at his teenage years or even his childhood to paint a clearer picture. Unfortunately, at the time of making this video, the details of Koberger's childhood aren't well understood, but a former classmate of Koberger's high school did reach out to ABC News and shared several horror stories about their time in high school together, as did a few other students who knew him in his teenage years. Brian Koberger was never a very popular kid in school. His peers say that he was picked on a lot, particularly by the girls in his class. He was known for being overweight throughout his childhood, but Koberger didn't help his negative reputation when he began to bully other students the same way that he had been bullied all of his life. One former classmate spoke about Koberger and couldn't recall one good memory of their time together in high school. Koberger had attended Pleasant Valley High School, located in Broadheadsville, Pennsylvania. Broadheadsville is one of the smallest areas in Pennsylvania in terms of population. As of a 2010 census, the area was home to around 1,800 people, but it was the proud home of the entire Pleasant Valley School District. Broadheadsville only has a total area of around 4.3 square miles, meaning it's a truly tiny town on the grander scale of things. Just 461 families call Broadheadsville home, with the population being over 90% Caucasian. Most of the families who lived here were middle-aged and had an average household income of about $45,000. So it wasn't a particularly wealthy area, but the community did well for itself, all things considered. Crime was never a big deal in Broadheadsville either, and everyone knew everyone for the most part. It was truly a quiet, close-knit community that never really had any major issues, certainly not a place that you would expect to be the hometown of a future serial killer. A former high school classmate of Koberger spoke out about their time in high school together. 
He says that his weight was always the reason that people made fun of him in school. But many people steered clear of him because he was generally just a mean person. She mentioned how throughout his teen years, his weight was always the source of his ridicule, but he did his best to change that in his senior year. During the summer between his junior and senior year, he lost a serious amount of weight. When he returned to school, most of his classmates didn't even recognize him. One of his former classmates said that she was wondering who this new student was, but then it dawned on her. It was Brian Koberger. She said that following his weight loss, his anger and aggression grew to new levels. She said that he would often hit on girls in his class, but they were rarely ever interested in him. Rather than accepting the rejection and moving on like any healthy person would, Koberger would dwell on the girls and continue to pester them, wondering why they would turn him down. It seems as though he really couldn't understand why certain people just didn't like him and it was eating at him from the inside. He was described as being a bit of a loner. He would hang out with the other kids who were described as outcasts, but any time he tried to make his way into other friend groups, he just wouldn't be able to fit in. He always wanted to work his way up the proverbial ladder of popularity, but no one was willing to put up with him, especially the females in those groups, with some of the girls labeling him as a creep. One student who went to school with Koberger refused to classify him as either a friend or a peer, but merely labeled him as a bully. This friend said that Koberger would often place him in headlocks, pinning him against walls and generally tormenting him. The friend suggested that Koberger wanted to do everything in his power to be seen as dominant by the other students. Another high school friend spoke out against Koberger when the news came out of his arrest. This friend also claims that Koberger had serious anger issues and would often use illegal drugs behind the scenes. This drug addiction would follow him into his college years, with many people beginning to wonder if this addiction could have been how he was able to lose so much weight in such a small amount of time in high school. The list of people who despised Koberger goes on and on. There legitimately isn't enough time to cover all of the scary stories that were shared about him. Needless to say, it doesn't seem like Koberger's arrest was a surprise to anyone. It was simply a matter of time. If we move forward a few years, Koberger had recently graduated from college with a PhD in criminal justice. After obtaining this PhD, he began working at Washington State University as a teacher's assistant during college courses. One of his former students spoke about him, and it seems that Koberger's behavior and personality didn't change much since high school. He was still seen as a wannabe dominant figure who tried to hold students to impossible standards. One student in particular, Hayden Stinchfield, spoke about his time with Koberger and said that he would hold his students to what Koberger called a higher standard and would grade his students incredibly harshly, seemingly bullying them for doing their best. Hayden says that it felt as though Koberger was grading his students as if he were grading himself as a PhD student expecting them to be far more knowledgeable than they realistically could be at this point in their college education. The students who attended Koberger's class were so fed up with their poor grades that at one point, a large majority of the 150 student class created an uprising and demanded that the lead professor give them higher grades than what Koberger initially gave them. The professor scheduled a mock court session and essentially placed Koberger on trial for giving students bad grades. All 150 students were allowed to voice their concerns about Koberger, and the majority felt that he was overly critical and didn't judge them fairly. Only a small handful of students had positive things to say about Koberger, while the rest of them criticized him for being far too strict. Hayden, who attended this mock court session, said that the class didn't get out of hand. Everyone had their story to tell, but no one resorted to yelling or making baseless emotional arguments. All in all, the session was highly successful, and it seems that Koberger took the students' worries to heart. After the session was concluded, he began giving almost every student a high grade. Hayden recalls the weeks after the session had taken place and said that at one point, it seemed like it didn't really matter what kind of work you turned in, you were virtually guaranteed to get a good grade. But this was also around the same time that Brian Koberger's demeanor 
changed entirely. Hayden says that shortly after this mock court session took place, Koberger became more reserved, more introverted. He says that all of a sudden, Koberger seemed preoccupied and far less invested in the class. He began to grow out his facial hair and, in general, his hygiene took a turn. Hayden says that it didn't look like Koberger was doing well, and it felt as though he didn't want to be there. As his students would soon learn, their uprising against him wasn't the reason for his sudden changes in behavior. As it would turn out, Koberger had been hiding an incredibly dark secret. It was November 12th, 2022. Between 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. that evening, several college students had been attending a party at a fraternity house on the campus of Idaho State University. Later that evening, a couple of students left the party and headed toward the Corner Club Sports Bar in Moscow, Idaho. By 1 a.m., several of the students had called it a night and had begun to head back to their dorm rooms or homes and go to bed for the evening. By around 1.45 a.m., it's believed that every student had returned home from their evening out. It wouldn't be until around noon the following day that many of the students would begin to wake up, realizing that something was horribly wrong. Police say that they received a 911 call around noon that day, reporting that an unconscious student had passed out the night before and would not wake up. Police arrived at the scene within minutes, but it was quickly determined that this student had not been the victim of too much alcohol, they'd been murdered. Police closed off the scene of the crime and evacuated any nearby students. It was at this point that they realized the crime had gone much further than they could have ever expected. A total of four students were found unresponsive at the scene of the crime. Each of them had been murdered with a knife. After a coroner had examined all the forensic evidence left behind at the scene of the crime, it was determined that the students were most likely killed in their sleep, but that some of the victims had defensive wounds that may have suggested they had woken up during the attack. For the sake of the victims' families, I'm not going to dive any further into the details of the crimes, but it's important to mention that each of the four students had remarkably bright futures that were stolen and cut short at the hands of a savage monster. Ethan Chapin, age 20. Madison Mogan, age 21. Kaylee Gonsalves, age 21. And Zana Kernodal, age 20. Ethan Chapman was the boyfriend of Zana Kernodal. Ethan had been studying recreation, sport, and tourism management. His mother says that he was living his best life at college and had been having a great time during his studies. He loved being social with his friends and wanted to dedicate the rest of his life to helping others have happy experiences and make memories, hoping to find a job or create one in the recreation industry. Madison Mogan was always seen as a smart and witty young girl. She was known for having a go-getter attitude and was destined for great things. Madison was majoring in marketing and planned to move to Boise, Idaho after she graduated in the spring of 2023. She worked alongside her best friend, Zana Kernodal, and helped her operate and manage a local restaurant and keep up with the social media pages for the brand. Kaylee Gonsalves had been majoring in general studies and had been close friends with Madison Mogan since middle school. The two were often seen as sisters as they did everything together. Kaylee had recently purchased a Range Rover that she was very proud of and had made plans to travel to Europe in 2023. She had a job lined up after college and worked incredibly hard toward her future career. Zana Kernodal was a junior who had been majoring in marketing. She was a very easygoing, lighthearted person, but she was dedicated toward crafting the future she had always dreamed of. The girlfriend of Ethan Chapin, Zana was ready for whatever the future may have had in store for her, and was a vibrant student with big plans ahead. After the heartbreaking murders had taken place, police announced in December of 2022 that they'd narrowed down their suspect to the owner of a white Hyundai Elantra that was seen in the area. Of the 22,000 people in the area that drove a vehicle that matched this description, Brian Koberger was announced as the lead suspect after investigators say that they found trace amounts of his DNA at the scene of the crime. They traced Koberger in his vehicle all the way back to his parents' home in Pennsylvania. Here, they staked out his parents' house for several days while confirming that he was their primary suspect. Later moving in and placing him under arrest on December 30th, 2022. 
One of the most shocking details that investigators learned after arresting Koberger is that he may have had a relationship with convicted serial killer Dennis Rader, also known as the BTK killer. Concerns about this relationship with the killer were voiced by Rader's own daughter, Carrie Rawson. She says that she learned that Koberger had studied closely with Catherine Ramsland, an expert on the BTK investigation and subsequent arrest of Dennis Rader. Ramsland had crafted a career out of being an expert on serial killers, but Rader's daughter says that Koberger's relationship may have gone further than simply being infatuated with criminals and serial killers. She posted to Twitter and voiced her concerns that Koberger may have reached out to her father in the past and may have spoken with him shortly before he committed the Idaho University murders. Rader's daughter says that Dr. Ramsland would know for sure whether or not Dennis Rader had any connection to the Idaho murders, but Ramsland allegedly isn't opening up about this or speaking about the situation publicly. Carrie Rawson says that her father has a lot in common with Brian Koberger. She mentioned that Koberger was a criminology student, but added that her father also has a degree in criminal justice. At the moment, we don't know if there's any real connection here between the BTK killer and Koberger, but it's certainly a strange coincidence that police will almost certainly look into in the future. Unfortunately, after this video is posted, there isn't any way that I can update with any new details about the case. So I ask that as new details emerge, share them in the comments below so that this video can serve as a source of new information as well as the foundation of information that's already been shared in the case. After all was said and done, Brian Koberger's family released a statement and said, first and foremost, we care deeply for the four families who have lost their precious children. There are no words that can adequately express the sadness we feel, and we pray for them each day. We will continue to let the legal process unfold, and as a family, we will love and support our son and brother. We fully cooperated with law enforcement agencies in an attempt to seek the truth and promote his presumption of innocence rather than judgment of unknown facts and making erroneous assumptions. We respect privacy in this matter as our family and the family suffering loss can move forward through the legal process. With that, we've reached the end of today's story. Don't forget, if you want to see more true crime stories, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. If you'd like to help out with the operating cost of the channel, you can also click the blue join button below this video, but that's entirely optional. With that said, my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.